In this data set, I report implied equity risk premiums going back in time. You're saying implied what? So let's step back. Let's think about what an equity risk premium is. An equity risk premium is the price of risk in equity markets. You still don't know what I'm talking about, right? To get you to invest in a risky asset, I've got to offer you inducement, a premium. The premium being over and above the risk-free rate. So if you can make 5% risk-free to get you to invest in stocks, I've got to offer you 8, 9, 10, 11%. That extra amount that I need to offer you to get you to invest in stocks is called the equity risk premium. What we're trying to compute is not your risk premium or mine, it's a market consensus. What is the market building in as an equity risk premium? So that is something you'll find in every risky asset class. In equity, we call it the equity risk premium. In the bond market, we call it a default spread. In the real estate market, it's the excess of the cap rate over the risk-free rate. But in this, in this data set, I focus on the equity risk premium. Now, most people, when they compute the equity risk premium, look backwards. They compute a historical equity risk premium. In fact, there's another data set of mine that you might have seen where I report the historical risk premium for U.S. equities. The historical risk premium is the premium that you'd have earned on stocks over and above a risk-free rate in a past time period, the last 10 years, the last 50 years, the last 100 years. But that choice that you make of how far back you go, whether you use short-term or long-term rates, T-bills or T-bonds in the US, and even how you compute the average can make a difference in how much that historical equity risk premium can be. If you get a chance, visit my historical risk premium data set because I give you the ranges of equity risk premium just for the US you get looking at past data. The bottom line on historical risk premiums and the reason I don't like them is they're noisy. So even with 100 years of history, when I tell you the equity risk premium is 5%, what I'm not telling you is the standard error in that number is about 2%, which means the true risk premium can be anywhere from 1% to 9%. It can be affected by your estimation choices, how far back you go, short-term or long-term risk-free rates, now how you compute averages, and will reflect the past. When in fact, what you want is a risk premium that reflects where you are in the market today and what people expect for the future. It's to combat all of these limitations of the historical risk premium that I started computing what I call an implied equity risk premium about 30 years ago. Sounds fancy, but I drew on the bond, bond market. Think of how we compute the yield to maturity in a bond. We take the price of the bond, we take coupons in the face value, and we solve for that discount rate that makes the present value the cash flows, the coupons and face value equal to the price of the bond. It's an internal rate of return for the bond. If I could do that for stocks, I could get a forward-looking equity risk premium, right? And that's precisely what I've tried to do for the last 30 years. At the start of every year, I look at the level of the index. So that's what we're paying to, to buy stocks today. Rather than get coupons, you're going to get cash flows from holding these stocks, either as dividends or buybacks. So I start with the dividends and buybacks for the most recent time period, which is all I know. And then I forecast a growth in those dividends and buybacks based on what analysts are estimating is growth in earnings for the stocks in the index. Now, those are estimates. Those estimates could be wrong, but I'm building them in to get my expected cash flows in year one, year two, year three. Stocks can last forever. I can't estimate cash flows forever. At the end of year five, at least in my estimation, I stop. And I assume that beyond that, cash flows continue to grow forever at the risk-free rate. You've probably seen me use this risk-free rate proxy for growth in other contexts as well, and I find it very useful. So my cash flows essentially are not just for the next five years, they're forever. And I solve for that discount rate. Solve basically is a, is a strong word because if I were doing this by hand, I'd have to do trial and error, try different discount rates. But in Excel, you can use the solver function or the gold seek function because you know the level of the index, you know the cash flows, and so you can solve or gold seek for the discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows equal to the index. That's an internal rate of return for stocks. That is an expected annual return on stocks for the long term based on what people are paying for stocks today. You subtract out the risk-free rate, you get an implied equity risk premium. Note again, I'm not, you know, you're not pass, you're not passing judgment here. You're essentially taking how the market is pricing stocks and backing out of the pricing what the expected return on stocks to be. It's agnostic in term when it comes to theory, it's entirely driven by the market. 
Could you be wrong in your estimate? Absolutely, to the extent that the analyst estimates of growth are wrong, cash flows are wrong. But if you look at the standard error of this estimate, an implied equity risk premium estimate, it's a fraction of the standard error you get on historical risk premiums. So as you look at the estimation details, here are the numbers I need to compute the equity risk premium. And I'll talk a little bit about how I get them. I need trailing 12 month numbers for dividends and buybacks for all of the stocks in the S&P 500, which is the index I've chosen to compute the implied equity risk premium on going back to 1960. So look at the base year numbers, trailing 12 month numbers for dividends and buybacks. Now, I do give choices there. If you want to compute the implied equity risk premium and you want to download the, the implied equity risk premium spreadsheet and change this base, here are the choices you can add. You can use the trailing 12 month numbers. You can use a trailing 12 month number and adjust the payout for the fact that over time, I'll have to come up with a payout that can sustain my growth rate. Put simply, if I expect uh, you know, earnings to grow at 3% a year forever after year five and my return on equity is 15%, my payout in year five has to be 80%, one minus 3% divided by 15%. So the second choice you have is to just take the trailing 12 month number and adjust the payout. The third is to normalize numbers. What does that mean? It, uh, you, know, you can use the 10 year averages for earnings and payout, arguing that you don't want to use last year's numbers because they might be too high or too low. I also compute a net cash yield where I net out issuances from buybacks. And the average cash flow yield, I replace your base year cash flow with what the cash flow would have been if I, my cash yield, if I use the cash yield for the last decade. So actually in my implied equity risk premium spreadsheet, I have five different variations of the implied equity risk premium. Trailing 12 months, the simplest, just takes the base year numbers, grows them at the same level as earnings trailing 12 months with adjusted payout, adjust the cash payout to get to a sustainable payout. The average cash flow yield is basically replacing current cash flows with what the cash flows would have been on av if I'd used the average yield over the last 10 years. The net cash yield just nets out the issuances from the, from the cash, from the trailing 12 month data. And finally, the normalized numbers just normalize both earnings and payout ratios over time. So if you want to change these and toggle these, you can. The one number that I have the longest history for is the trailing 12 month number, because that I've been computing since the 1990s. So it is the number that you can use if you want to compare across time. Now, if you think about what is it that changes your implied equity risk premium, it's dynamic. Every time the index level changes, the implied equity risk premium will change. In what direction? If the index rises, you're going to see the equity risk premium decrease, holding all else constant. The index falls, the equity risk premium will rise. In fact, one measure of a crisis to me is the price of risk rises dramatically. The implied equity risk premium will pop up during a crisis. The second driver of the implied equity risk premium is the base year cash flow, the dividends and the buybacks. If you have significant dividends and, and buybacks from companies, you will get a higher equity risk premium, other things remaining equal, if you're starting with a higher cash flow number. The third is the expected growth rate. The higher the expected growth rate, the higher the equity risk premium is going to be. So you are, in a sense, dependent on analyst forecasts of growth being right, because if they overestimate growth, you're going to overestimate your equity risk premium. And finally, because you net out the risk-free rate to get your equity risk premium, all else being held equal, the higher the risk-free rate, the lower the equity risk premium, though there's an offsetting effect, which is remember my growth rate in perpetuity also increases to match my risk-free rate. So when you raise risk-free rates, if you don't see equity risk premiums change as dramatically as you thought they would, it's because the growth is adjusting as well. I hope you get a chance to play with this spreadsheet because it is a useful spreadsheet <coughs> to get a sense of what the market price of risk is. And let's face it, we're all at the mercy of the market price of risk in the equity markets when we think about how much to pay for stocks. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.